there were no words or numbers painted boldly on the card. Ozzy preferred a lower profile, but one glance and you knew it was the high sheriff. A collection of antennas, a small round blue light on the dash, partially hidden. A big brown Ford with four doors and black wheels, same as virtually every other high sheriff in the state. He parked it next to the red Saab, which was parked away from the other cars. Ozzy got out as Jake was getting out, and together they crossed the parking lot. Anything new? Jake asked. Nothing, Ozzy said. He was wearing a dark suit with black cowboy boots. Jake, the same, minus the boots. You? Nothing. I guess the shit'll hit the fan in a moment. Ozzy laughed and said, I can't wait. The church originally was a red brick chapel with a squatty steeple above a set of double front doors. Over time, though, the congregation had added the obligatory metal buildings, one beside the chapel that dwarfed it, and one behind it where the youth played basketball. On a small knoll nearby, there was a cemetery under shady trees, a quiet and pretty place to be buried. A few smokers were getting their last-minute drags, countrymen in old suits reluctantly wore. They were quick to speak to the sheriff. They nodded politely to Jake. Inside, there was a respectable crowd scattered throughout the dark stained oak pews. The lights were low. An organist softly played a mournful dirge, priming the crowd for the sorrow to come. Seth's closed casket was draped in flowers and situated below the pulpit. His pallbearers sat grim-faced and shoulder to shoulder off to the left near the piano. Jake and Ozzy sat alone on a back row and began looking around. Grouped together not far away were some black folks, five in total. Ozzy nodded at them and whispered, You dress, that's Lily Lane. Jake nodded and whispered back, Who are the others? Ozzy shook his head. Can you tell from here? Jake stared at the back of Letty's head and tried to imagine the adventures they were about to share. He had yet to meet this woman, had never heard her name until the day before, but they were about to become well acquainted. Letty sat unknowing, her hands folded in her lap. That morning she had worked for three hours before being asked by Herschel to leave. On her way out, he informed her that her employment would be terminated as of 3 p.m. Wednesday, the following day. At that point, the house would be locked up and deserted until further orders from the court. Letty had $400 in her checking account, one she kept away from Simeon, and she had $300 in a pickle jar hidden in the pantry. Beyond that, she was broke and had slim prospects for meeting the she had not spoken to her husband in almost three weeks. Occasionally, he would return home with a paycheck or some cash. Usually, though, he was just drunk and needed to sleep it off. Soon to be unemployed with bills and people to feed, Letty could have sat there listening to the organ and fretted over her future. But she did not. Mr. Hubbard had promised her more than once that when he died, and he knew his death